Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. So we need to switch from product to experience and maybe rename the product backlog to the experience backlog. <laughs> and they need to be experience uh-huh. owners instead of product owners, etc. And that makes us more inclusive of the others in the organization such as finance marketing support who also impact the net promoter score and whatever you have of the of the customers who is jürgen apello <laughs> that's me <laughs> um <laughs> I usually describe myself as a speaker, a writer, and entrepreneur. Those uh, three words seem to describe most of what I'm doing. Um, and um, I'm from the Netherlands, I'm 51 years old, um, and uh, leading a pretty happy life, I suppose. Nice. So what what's important to you? Uh, I want to dive a little bit into like, you know, your current motivations and what's important to you. So you've done a lot in the sense of uh, uh, for, I think, uh, this whole movement. And I want to come back to uh, complexity, um, to uh, uh, complexity science. But like what uh, uh, right now, when you look at your life, um, uh, when you look at the, just the, the the work environment as well, because I think it's hard to do. Uh, distinguish between you know our, our work lives and what we do and and uh, yeah. uh, what's important to you what motivates you currently what motivates me is is um, uh, coming up with uh, things that people find useful and that help them be happier in their jobs that's why I call my company happy Melly <laughs> because it is after a famous uh, billboard here in Rotterdam where I live that says uh, happy uh, so that says uh, Mali Sham hates her job it's an it's a work of art that has been there in that street for 25 years and some people wonder why is Mali Sham hating her job <laughs> uh, it doesn't explain it's just Mali Sham hates her job uh, with a picture of Mali smiling in the camera, hating her job. And that for me was the, the inspiration of calling my company Happy Mali, because I want Mali to be happy. Why are people hating their job? They're in the wrong job <laughs> or they should change their job. So for me, that's an explanation of what I like doing. And um, it helped uh, when I discover stuff or invent stuff and describe it in such a way that people say, well, um, now I finally understand it, <laughs> or now it fi- it is finally useful. I have I, I get these compliments every now and then. Like I, I do the digging around and reading dozens of books, and then people say, "Wow, thank you for summarizing all of that." Now now it has finally become applicable and useful for me. It it saves me reading all that other stuff. <laughs> Um, yeah. So yeah, being being helpful, uh, uh, helping people be happier in their jobs. That's more or less what I what I love doing. Why is happiness so important? You've written a book on it too. I mean, it's a pretty well, basic question, a, but from your perspective, yeah. you know, because it, it, most people are not happy at work. <laughs> yeah, well, that's um, a simple and at the same time a deep question, I suppose. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, I just noticed that I have never done things, uh, at least not for long, that, uh, that I hated. Um, right when I finished my studies at the University in Delft, I studied software engineering. Uh, all my peers basically disappeared into regular jobs mm-hmm. <laughs> for high paying uh, consultancy companies or IT companies, whatever. And I thought, Nah, it doesn't seem interesting to me. That doesn't make me happy to be, uh, as what some people will say, a lone slave, a, 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 a wage slave, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, no, I, I just started my own company and I became a freelancer and I started writing courseware and I did very different things mm-hmm. compared to my peers because that seemed more exciting and was riskier or uncertain, but I loved it more. 
times. And that has always been the case that every choice I made, I make the choices that make sense to me because um, they help me be happier in the, in the work that I do. Um, How much and, does that yeah. have to do with autonomy? Because I have a, a, a like similar experience where I started a software development company in college. I started, you know, writing code or designing to uh, in high school. So uh, I've worked like you know my, you know, since I was in high school for myself. But I've also taken pauses where I worked inside the companies and. Um, Autonomy is big part for me. Is is it the autonomy that makes you happy, or is it other things? Like, what is it for you? It is uh, definitely part of it. Um, I mean, I one of the Manchester Theatre Row games or exercises that I created is the movie motivators, and freedom is one of the ten motivators in that exercise. And I have always said that for me, it's at the top. I want my freedom. I want my autonomy because <laughs> uh, I am unhappy if others make the decisions for me, like what project I am supposed to work on and things like that. That never interested me. Uh, even when I was um, when I was CIO uh, for uh, for a good number of years, uh, then then I was not at all interested in working on projects for customers. Mm -hmm. um, I was very interested in working on improving our own processes as a company and then helping the developers have more enjoyable jobs and, and basically inward looking in the company because then I could choose my own work basically I could mm -hmm. choose what I wanted to improve next and I, I was not interested in something that somebody else handed me and said well I want this e-commerce website and said, okay whatever <laughs> that's your problem not mine <laughs> yeah. um so yeah autonomy is a, is a big one for me definitely it is part of of what i like doing but also i'm a very curious person i, I am now preparing for a new workshop that i will start giving in autumn in the autumn um and um, i love the research i just love digging into articles and books and drawing connections between things mm -hmm. and then coming up with new insights and then think oh this is something that i need to add to the workshop because i think this is new um mm -hmm. and then turning that into new exercises so the the curiosity part the the uh, the, the finding things out is important and also the creative ex aspect of it. So how do I now bring this to people in a way that they like it, that they enjoy having a game with each other, uh, mm -hmm. do, uh, doing an exercise, etc. So uh, yeah, it, the freedom is one part, but also curiosity and creativity, uh, those combined basically make my job. And I'm assuming that result of uh, understanding that what you're doing and creating is actually helping others is very motivating as a satisfaction too. For sure, yeah. I was, uh, last example, I was in Iran uh, two, three weeks ago, which was an amazing trip in itself, by the way. Um, and uh, someone, um, I had coffee with someone who showed me around the city a bit and said, uh, well, I just wanted to thank you for, for the workshop I did with you uh, seven years ago. He was in my workshop in Turkey back then and mm -hmm. said, and thanks to you, I quit my job because I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then I, I, I started my own company and now he was CEO of a company of 70 people. And mm -hmm. he said, that would never have happened if I had not met you and just decided, okay, this apparently I need to quit my job because this is not making me happy. And, and that, makes, that makes me so, feel so good. I mean, I, I, I didn't know, I was, I was completely unaware of this person somewhere on the other side of the planet, uh, apparently being influenced by my workshop. And, and I have similar stories from people reading my books. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's super cool. That makes my day when someone and shares an example like that. I heard coffee makes your day too. And uh, uh, given that you were in Turkey and uh, <laughs> uh, in Iran, uh, uh, I'm assuming you tried the Turkish coffee. And, uh, and you know, what, what's your favorite coffee? Just more on the personal side, because uh, I heard that you do take your coffee seriously. Like it's, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, to be honest, I like the kind of coffee that other people may not refer to really as coffee, because I want it with a lot of milk. <laughs> so I like I like my lattes and my cappuccinos and 
uh, things like that. Uh, I don't drink straight coffee. That's uh, that's not my thing. And so, and for some coffee uh, uh, connoisseurs, that would be spoiling the coffee. My God, you throw milk in there? Are you insane? Uh, yeah, sorry, that's how I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, it used to be like that, and then I, I don't know. It's been like ten plus years. I switched, and I only drink black coffee uh, up here in new england like dunkin donuts uh, again you probably some people wouldn't consider a coffee either similar to <laughs> uh but i used to like that but now it's yeah, all dark stuff and i joke around like turkish coffee is still my i was born in sarajevo so like that whole balkans okay. area is uh, Makes sense. uh impacted by that um yeah. Were you surprised by the reaction i mean you talked about like you know the gratification of you know uh, putting something out there that you research that you you know you put your own thoughts on it like with the management 3.0 and like just how much receptive the community and everybody was were you surprised by that like what was your initial I know it's been years but what was your initial reaction to that to be honest yes I am still surprised <laughs> yeah. uh, that it took off uh, that well uh, I can rationally explain it uh, mm -hmm. Because, as I said, I do. I, I, I love the research. I love. I love the digging around and and seeing connections uh, uh, between things. Actually, this is uh, interesting. Um, at the personal level, when I was uh, 11 years old, I got this this advice from the teacher back then, like all kids at that age got before they went to high school. What the teachers at the time thought the area where I was supposed to find my job. And apparently the t my teacher at that time noticed that I loved analyzing stuff. So he said, maybe you should become an analyst or whatever. And I had no idea what an analyst was. I didn't know what analysts did. Yeah. <laughs> but apparently I like solving problems and, 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 and checking things out to see how they worked. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um and yeah that has been with me ever since so i still do that uh, and that is something that people appreciate and i have this creative streak i, I like turning that into visuals and and, and good storytelling and uh, mm -hmm. so i often say i just steal stuff i just borrow stuff from many sources <laughs> but i present it in a in a way that's more better <laughs> better consumable i suppose because um, I read a lot of books and to be honest, my God, they're so boring. Uh, very often I go through them, mm -hmm. uh, but I can imagine people giving up uh, very soon. I, I like writing in a different way that is more entertaining um, and that still has a, a high information density. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, I think, explains why Manchu Tirolo took off at the time. It's uh, well mm -hmm. researched, a lot of references there but also presented with a lot of uh, visual stories, humor, uh, et cetera. Yeah, and in a sense, uh, it's really, especially the main that you're writing about, which is uh, has to do a lot of with, you know, complexity, complexity science, complexity management. Uh, there are a lot of, like you said, books, they, you know, a lot of good content, but the way that um, concepts and things are described is not necessarily easy to understand. I want to start maybe over on a, on a fun part uh, uh, by asking you this question. What lies between order and chaos? Uh, what li complexity lies between order and chaos? That's, that's yeah. the whole point of, of uh, systems at the edge of chaos. You can also at the edge of order because they are right there in between. I mean, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's what scientists have uh, been working on ever since the 90s basically i'm i am i am so old that i remember chaos theory emerging that was mm -hmm. uh, i think in 87 that it became a big thing in 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 the mathematical department so i studied software engineering in delft and we shared the same faculty with with uh, mathematics uh, so we and the mathematicians were in the same building. We got the same study society, actually. And one year, the theme was chaos. Actually, I was the one, Arima, I came up with that term chaos because mm -hmm. uh, I noticed this was something big among the math people. Um, so I said, well, let's make that the theme of the yearbook. Uh, I still have it behind <laughs> me. Uh, yeah, yeah, over here. Yeah, 
so this is the this is the book well you can see it on the podcast but this is the yeah. the, the yearbook that i not the same the second one chaos you see chaos here if they can you know, uh, yeah chaos you see that yeah Those yeah are, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 80, 88, 89. Wow. And my drawings as well. <laughs> so, yeah, that's when it started. And that turned into complexity science in the 90s, basically. And I thought it was so inspiring, super fascinating. Mm -hmm. it, 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 they explain how the universe works. Because yeah. <laughs> everything is a complex system. So it, it, was a, it was wow moments all the time when I read those books. And then... Uh, Agile software development emerged early 2000s, and I saw all the parallels. They even mm -hmm. use the same words, emergence, self-organization. <laughs> that well, that's the same thing. It's just applied complexity science, basically. Is complexity science still one of your favorite topics? It is. I don't do much reading in that area, to be honest, at the time, because uh, I have read so much already, and there were so many other interesting topics uh, out there as well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the science doesn't change that much. I mean, it's just the way the world works. I now get the basic concepts. I'm not an expert by far, but I know mm -hmm. what fitness landscapes are and uh, reflexivity and emergence and all that. Um, so don't need to read more about it. Uh, when it comes to management, uh, when it comes to agile movement, you know, a lot of like people that have started, people that are more experienced understand, like you said, you know, we've taken these complexity science, complexity management ideas, um, uh, uh, put a agile, we tend to put agile in everything, right? Like it's just like, uh, what is your take on how much uh, uh, is a common knowledge around complexity management and complexity science in the agile and management circles? Mm, not much. <laughs> Do you think it's improving? Um, or do you think the awareness is? Maybe it's it's not really advanced, uh, to okay. be honest. Um, I'm not an advanced thinker by any stretch of the imagination, don't get me wrong. So, uh, but in the land of the blind, uh, the one with the one <laughs> eye uh, sees most. <laughs> um, uh. So, um, but I am sometimes, yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical and critical of how other people approach things because I find that there is no complexity mindset behind it. I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. I just discussed that um, a couple of days ago again. There's often this suggestion that you should not reward individuals in the Agile community, that instead you should reward teams. Because mm -hmm. if you reward individuals, uh, then the problem is that people are going to compete on a team. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of evidence for that. I, t I totally understand that, that uh, suggestion. But what people apparently don't seem to understand is when you reward teams, you get exactly the same thing, only one level higher. And then the teams are going to compete with each other. I mean, it's not that not that difficult to understand this right mm -hmm. <laughs> you just you didn't solve the problem you moved it one level up exactly. it's like not it's not not cleaning your house but just swiping the dirt under the carpet the dirt is still there it's just in a different place so now the teams are going to compete with each other how do you solve that well maybe we should not reward teams we should reward the departments all right congratulations you moved the problem yet another <laughs> level up yeah. you're not solving the problem <laughs> This is for me an example of someone who was not thinking in in in, 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 a, in a, as a systems thinker. It's not a complexity mm -hmm. mindset, to be honest. Well, even systems thinking. I was talking to Dave Snowden, and he was shedding all over systems thinking. And I think you know for several reasons, but I think you know one of them is that even systems thinking is misunderstood, and everybody mm -hmm. talks about systems thinking, but uh, it's not just physical systems right it, it, it's social systems it, it, it's there's many different ways of looking at systems and i think you know uh, the people a lot of times people look at systems as just the physical ones um to come back to this topic uh, of uh, complexity and maybe even systems thinking in what ways are the teams and organizations like living systems because living systems are complex adaptive systems right 
So yeah. how are organizations, because we have metaphors, we compare organizations to, to machines, to this and that, that, that is you know, not necessarily a complex adaptive system. Mm -hmm. So in yeah, what ways well, are organizations more like adaptive complex systems? Well, because like all those other complex systems, they consist of parts. They are the people uh, uh, whose um, uh, um, uh, performance depends on the interactions with all the other parts around them. So I very much agree with the idea that you cannot really measure an individual person's performance. The performance of the person depends on their relationships with the parts around them, the mm -hmm. interactions with the others. Google has proven this already with their research a number of years ago that most of the performance is in the, in the relationships between people and the dynamics of the group and not so much in the individual person. Um, that's totally in line with, with complexity uh, science. Um, and, uh, and that also explains uh, that you, you don't simply um, um, uh, solve the problem of rewarding uh, uh, people by moving at one level up because, yeah, teams also communicate with each other and are in relationship with each other in the organization. There is a reward system in, in complex systems the parts are rewarded. They are rewarded for contributing to the other parts around them. So, mm -hmm. excuse me. So the uh, in the glass of water. So uh, the um, the 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 performance of an individual part needs to be measured in in terms of how well has it contributed to the others. So basically, that's what 360 degree evaluations do in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Where everyone that a person is is uh, has been working with decide with each other on how much value that person has contributed to those to those relationships. So there there still needs to be an an individual reward, but that reward needs to be decided by all the parts around that um, uh, that individual. And that is how complex systems work. There are all, always reward systems. In any complex adaptive system, there are reward systems. Yes, the parts are rewarded, but the reward depends on the relationships uh, between the others and not by some manager <laughs> who exactly. is uh, handling everything. And then you have solved the problem because this is fractal. This also applies to teams and, and departments, uh, basically. Well, that's the thing. And like, uh, I want to explore this a little bit more because it also when it comes to like, you know, organizations setting goals or like, you know, purpose, uh, you know, a lot of times one size fits all. But if we go back to, you know, just understanding people, understanding uh, uh, complexity, there's multiple levels of how we look at the purpose, how we look at the goals, how we look at rewards and how we incentivize. And for if we look at the bigger organization, it's not really set up or architected mm -hmm. to be sure. uh, coming back to this as, as organizations and evolving systems. It, like our organizations are not set up to deal with complexity. And right. I think people like yourselves and others are trying to really uh, uh, describe that. And that's really what, underneath all of your uh, approaches, descriptions, that's really, you know, a lot of times what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And yet we still see many organizations, you know, not fully understanding the design, architecture, uh, policies, including, you know, some of these goals. So how do you go about helping organizations deal with this? Well well, um, good question. I, uh, I noticed that organizations need uh, uh, um, patterns to be copied, uh, examples from others. That's why uh, solutions, quote unquote, like SAFE and Spotify model and others are so popular because they give organizations something to copy and try out and adapt to their own uh, context. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as you understand that what works for others doesn't necessarily work for you, but at least you have a starting point for, for experimentation. 
Um, so but maybe let's pause there. I, I think there's a big, there's something there that you said that I, that I want to explore a little bit more. As long as you understand that it's a point for experimentation. And yeah. I think that's not how it's understood. That's not how it's sold, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's totally. sold as the solution. And, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Literally, um, uh, the, the, the safe website has these implementation roadmaps, like literally the word mm -hmm. implementation, as if you're as if you're rolling out some software product that needs to be installed in the organization. So the terminology is is somewhat worrying. Um, fortunately, mm -hmm. there are smart people out there and, and good coaches and consultants that um, know how to go about using these frameworks and toolboxes in a smart way, um, disregarding the implementation approach, but just more on a, uh, on a, uh, um, uh, with an approach where you treat the framework as a toolbox of good ideas that you could mm -hmm. apply individually, perhaps um so uh yeah that's that's the that's the starting point you need to see it as an experiment uh, but that is also how complex systems work it is uh, uh i described that in the i think in the last chapter of measure theory at all. there are different ways that that um, organisms evolve and the horizontal gene transfer is one of the most successful ways in in the biosphere. There's basically organisms flinging DNA around <laughs> and picking it up from others. That's what bacteria do, yeah. by the way. They just copy parts and from each other. Oh, this sounds. This seems like a cool piece of DNA. Give me that. <laughs> yeah. See what it does for me. Oops, that didn't work out well. I'll try something else. So horizontal gene transfer is is a big thing in the biosphere. Actually, uh, what humans do, we call that sex, yeah. is a rather special case in 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 the in the, uh, in, the in the biosphere. Uh, there's a, a very complicated way of mixing two strands of DNA. So just but sharing. More, is it more like lean and agile, and now how agile is emerging? Like in other, uh, it, would you call that linear, where like it was adopted in? Um, you know, manufacturing mass production. Now that was applied to knowledge work that has more complexity to it. Perhaps is would that be a linear? Um, well, um, I think the, the the principles of lean apply have applied very well to manufacturing, of course. But there was the context of knowing what the end result had to be. Because yeah. it was all about optimization at the Toyota um, um, manufacturing plants. They, they knew what car had to be created. They just wanted to be flexible so that they could change things fast. Because, yes, customer requirements changed and demand changed all the time. Um, but the way they manufactured the cars is not the same as the way they designed the cars. So discovery is a, a, something different compared to delivery. Um, Correct. What, we... I, what, I, what I meant more is like uh, this, uh, as, almost like what you described earlier, is, is borrowing these ideas from Lean, applying them to the context of Agile and more software development. Would that be more of that horizontal gene sharing or g uh, uh, or maybe i misunderstood yes uh, no 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 yeah um yeah so indeed um uh, uh, that is horizontal copying from one domain to the other but as yeah. i said the, the 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 context is different because uh, in manufacturing you know what the end result is and and, and in software development you don't because mm -hmm. the whole point of software is that you make each piece only once <laughs> That's because <it's, laughs> a lot of it is discovery, um, mm -hmm. and uh, that means it's the principles apply, but the practices are are very different. And I'm also somewhat against certain metaphors such as inventory. You know, there's a there's been this emphasis on inventory being waste in in lean. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense if you make a car, but it makes no sense if you do software development, because um, uh, when you have when you do creative work then the work that is in progress is not necessarily waste. It is mm -hmm. stuff that is, is, is working in your subconscious um, that may need time sometimes to form into something beautiful or useful mm -hmm. or whatever. 
I'm a writer. I know how these things, these creative processes <laughs> work. You cannot just, uh, I cannot just push things out by the minute and then and deliver deliver chapters uh, one by one. Some things you have to have to simmer for a while in your, <laughs> in your well, head. And, and uh, actually, uh, Jerry Weinberg called that the Fieldstone method, <laughs> where he, he, he wrote many pieces of text and they were just lying about doing nothing. And then at some point, they, oh, what I wrote here is actually it connects to that other unfinished thing that I wrote back then last year. And then they start cross pollinating. And that's how mm -hmm. new stuff emerges. So waste in lean is not the same uh, inventory so inventory in lean in manufacturing is not the same as inventory in a creative job so yeah. the metaphor does not translate well because yeah. it's taken out of context so you have to adapt uh, well it's also i think one is about efficiency the other one is more about innovation and emergence so like you know i, I exactly. joke around but it, 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 it's uh, you know, I let things marinate in my head. And I've been writing yeah. actually a book for the last couple of years. And a lot of times I let things marinate. And it's like, you know, one morning just it hits me or like I'm taking a shower or going for a walk or run. Um, and it hits me. I'm like, all of that inventory <laughs> was there for a reason in order exactly. to make a breakthrough uh, on, yeah. uh, on this idea or concept. So. Or it is because of a conversation you have with someone. They, oh, well, that's, that solves the thing that I have been thinking about for the last couple of months. Now I can write that blog post <laughs> or something mm -hmm. like that. So yeah, that's innovation is very different. Yeah. So context matters, right? And then a lot of times we're looking for easy solutions. There's something about humans to preserve energy, to do whatever, which I don't fully understand. But there we're eager to jump to, to, to quick solutions and uh, our environment and our context is not necessarily conducive uh, right now to that. Um, what are your thoughts on context and why, you know, is it important to you or uh, why, why should it be if it is? Uh, or why it is, why is it if? Well, uh, obviously context is important but uh, context has changed uh, uh, definitely last year because of the, the whole COVID uh, crisis of course people have been working from home instead of at the office uh, there has been uh, interesting um, uh, discussions going on where companies said uh, some companies have to get back to the office because we're not innovative enough anymore when everyone is at their home uh, 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 workplaces uh, being quite productive that the research uh, the says that people are more productive when they are working by themselves that has apparently worked out uh, for the better but when they're not collaborating in the same room uh, the story goes that they're less innovative and less creative because they don't share as much ideas with each other interestingly enough I just read an, an, a counterpoint to that last week that I never thought of before, but it said uh, this has not been proven actually that people are less innovative when they join through Zoom calls or whatever. Um, and actually, um, when people get into a room with each other, there is a much higher chance that people conform to the norm of the local culture in the organization. You adapt, mm -hmm. like you, you switch to a different identity. Um, and that has an impact on how people think. Uh, it is. It has been said uh, by many that people are feel more themselves when they join through Zoom calls from their own home because I am now in my own house being me. I join a call, so I have a somewhat different identity when I when I join the call. And you can say, well, this is actually good for brainstorming discussions because you make it easier for people to bring their different perspectives, to bring their different personalities to problem solving. Because if you take them out of their own context, out of their own homes, you put them into an office, they're going to switch identity and suddenly groupthink emerges that you may not have wanted. 
So, and I thought, I just read that last week and I thought, wow, that's brilliant. So indeed it has not been proven that people are more innovative when they're in the same room. Maybe you should put them like in seven different locations in the world. Well, <laughs> one is it's in, also, one, yeah. But it's one also is in a Turkish matters. coffee bar, the other, <laughs> the, the other is in yeah. Iran, and the other is in whatever. And then you have them make a Zoom call discussing a, a difficult problem to solve. Maybe those mm. people are more innovative then because of the different context that they bring to the table. Well, that, that's what I'm like, you know, it's, it's been interesting for me, too, because like, you know, I switch between California, East Coast here and then, you know, Montenegro and Croatia mostly. Um, and it, it's just, it, it's, it goes back to that autonomy. It goes back to that freedom, like in a sense, I feel more motivated where I can work from anywhere. It's my decision to choose if I want to work 4 p.m. to midnight or work, you know, from 5 a.m. to, to uh, noon uh, or whatever it is. And, you know, where even organizations going back now are saying, okay, you know, they're defining company-wide policies versus allowing teams to decide or context to, to really, or adjust their approaches to their context. Do you think, or what are you seeing maybe like as far have organization, organizations maybe learned anything from COVID around the context and around that, self-organization that exists in living systems? Um, I think they have, uh, at least um, th there's this joke that has gone around uh, last year, who has impacted the organization the most? Was it the manager or the employee or the coach or COVID-19? Well, obviously it was COVID <laughs> uh, <laughs> that pushed organizations forward because they have resisted remote working, many of them for a long time, and now they had to, and they noticed, oh, it's actually not that bad. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, as we always been uh, fearful of. Um, so that's a good thing. And uh, fortunately, most people resist going back to the office full time. Of course, uh, most organizations want at least some kind of hybrid form. That is what they will, uh, most of them will end up with. Then the question is, how do you decide who is at the office when? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you said, yeah, some organizations will determine that for everyone. Actually, that's a minority of the companies I have noticed. Um, um, I believe Apple was in that category where they said at certain dates, everyone needs to be at the office. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, but that isn't even smart uh, uh, because then uh, on those dates, the offices will be cramped. <laughs> Mm -hmm. on those three days and the other two days it will be virtually empty it is not a smart way of, of dividing resources across uh, across all your workers um so it's better to leave the decision to teams and i think organizations many of them will have found out that people can self-organize pretty well uh, they did that when they were at home still stuff got done um, everyone was contributing, so they can probably also make a decision with their team. When should we be at the office and when can we work from home? Uh, you just probably need a little bit of coordination because if you let everyone decide for themselves and most of them are going to decide that Friday and Monday are the days to work at home mm -hmm. uh, because that's so convenient to have a long weekend. <laughs> uh, so you probably want to guide that a little bit. Um, but I do believe, and I see that also in the articles, because I, I have a, I have an alert on hi hybrid working and, and mm. things like that in, on Google News, because I keep up to date on what's happening there. And most organizations default to letting the teams decide uh, when to be at the office and, and when to be at home. But the core, like, it's really like, you know, I, I think we need things like COVID, because as humans, we get comfortable you know, with what, you know, it, it's, we get out, of, we have to get out of our comfort seats to say like, oh yeah, we can do this, right? So there is that in order, there needs to be some kind of push <laughs> a lot of times to get us our, uh, you know, out of our current perspectives or even paradigms. Um, uh, but there's also so much uh, desire for that linear kind of uh, uh, approaches thinking. And Again, if we just go back to 
kind of com where we start with complexity science is if we look at it like for most of living systems you have some type of uh boundaries or guardrails right and, and people self-organize so i think a lot of times when i work with uh, executives it's about creating that ecosystem where emergence can happen and you still need alignment and order to some extent and not order in a, in in a, <laughs> in a sense of complexity but more of a like alignment of guardrails and then in creating you know create that environment for uh for people to emerge and I'm kind of not necessarily worried, but I, I do think like, you know, speaking to you, speaking to like, you know, I've had several other people on, on the podcast. Um, I don't see this happening like for majority in the next 10 years where organizations fully understand the underlying principles of complexity and contextualizing things to their environment. Do you see that? Am I maybe just not as optimistic or do you see there the, is there is there are there signs that organizations are uh, uh, uh maturing in their understanding of how to deal with complexity um, um some are uh, others are not is that a problem i don't think so uh, survival yeah. is not mandatory as they say, uh, I don't care if some organizations don't make it and, and, and die in the next uh, decade, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, people will survive. They will find other jobs at, at mm -hmm. better run companies and everyone will be happier. Yes, it will be slightly stressful for some having to find another job. So what? Uh, that's yeah. just another tiny crisis to overcome. So I'm not worried about that. Uh, we see great examples of very inspiring things happening uh, um, with, with fast uh, growing companies that, by the way, are always organized in a lean and agile uh, mm -hmm. sense with, with lean startup design thinking kinds of practice, practices. All the fast growing companies, they know how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, just, I just finished the book uh, about Netflix by Reed Hastings, uh, No Rules Rules. Super interesting how they, how they set it all up. As you see it agile all the way, uh, yeah. basically how they, how they do that. And they have disrupted their industry. And they force their competitors to 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 adopt similar kinds of approaches. Otherwise, they would go out of business. You yeah. see the same in every industry. Uh, Tesla has disrupted the, the the car industry, so mm -hmm. leaving Volkswagen and others scrambling to catch up, and and modernize their software development uh, departments. Uh, that's a good yeah. thing because it means that people like me get invites uh, yeah. and uh, to to do workshops and, and, and presentations and everything that keeps me in business as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and some of them make it and others don't. And uh, yeah, as I said, I don't care if other, some don't make yeah. it, then let the bad ones perish and, and be replaced with better ones. Yeah, it's interesting. And it, it goes back again to, to uh, it's, it's how the nature is, it's how complex systems are, but like yet we're as humans, bias towards ourselves we think we're the center of the center of the world we think we're the only ones that are the most important on this planet right uh -huh. there, there there's that whole bias um i want to get your thought uh on, on this because related to all of this and i think it's a part that uh not many times is brought up but uh like self-determination theory or cognitive development uh uh, when it comes to motivation, when it comes to complex systems. Um, what is your thought on, in a sense, uh, on what's important to us, uh, uh, how we see world, and having many different, I guess, uh, uh, perspectives, how does that contribute to complexity? And I don't know how familiar with the, you are with the uh, um, self-determination theory. I saw you talk about it a little bit, uh, how desires uh, differ and how the structure, uh, uh, but I don't know if you want to maybe just expand on that a little bit, because I think that's that's really important from my perspective uh, to this whole. Well, 
Sure. Um, well, there are a number of theory. Indeed, the cell determination research or theory um, is is one of many that well, I refer to in, exactly. in, in my work. Um, and uh, for me, those those human desires, uh, self actualization and freedom and and social connectedness and whatever you have a number of categories, they all emerged uh, uh, through. Um, um, uh, the biological processes of uh, of uh, survival of the fittest that's the foundation mm -hmm. of, of 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 how the biosphere around us works and at some point this has resulted in humans as a, a byproduct of of, uh, of whatever else happened in the biosphere we're just an accident a fortunate accident <laughs> for, for us yeah from uh, our perspective to, not fortunate from uh, if you look at some well, of the other species <laughs> yeah yeah well i sometimes say humans for planet earth are just like a bad rash it's like like a, this <laughs> annoying phase like this annoying itch uh. <laughs> and at some point you will probably get rid of <laughs> because uh, we don't mean much on a geological scale to be honest <laughs> mm -hmm. and also okay we, we we're starting to mean a little bit in the in terms of the of the of the footprint and uh, uh, the uh, the biomass but still i think atlantic krill still outcompete us in terms of biomass on this planet there's more atlantic <laughs> krill out there than human beings the human, yeah. and, and, and and ants also uh, outpace us ten to one. <laughs> uh, so we're unimportant in 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 that sense. Um, but and we human beings, we have because of our biological needs, etc. We have this on the one hand, we have this need for freedom, but on the other hand, also this need for social relatedness, and sometimes those are compete with each other, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of that is really fascinating when you stick to the human perspective. And of course, I do that as well with my work and my presentations. I want to help humans be happy uh, because that fascinates me and it also gets me paid which is important mm -hmm. important because I have a life to live as well but when I go to that higher level I sometimes think it's all irrelevant because mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, you, you get to the philosophical level of what what are human beings doing here in the world yeah we're making a little bit of a mess of it causing a sixth extinction well planet earth has survived the previous five <laughs> so it will probably yeah. survive this one as well mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite fragments i think i've included in one of my books that i got from uh, from a, a science article was a, a many um a, a billions of years ago um uh no there was just two two or three billion years ago there was this new gas that emerged that was highly toxic and it wiped out like 95 percent of all species it was amazing wow. and it, we call that oxygen <laughs> that gives us that's an interesting perspective isn't it it was uh, an accidental byproduct of of plants who, mm. who emitted oxygen as a waste as a, a product into into the atmosphere and it killed 95 percent the, the, we never punished plants for that. <laughs> yeah. Wiping out so many other species with their waste. Um, I, I love that kind of thinking. Um, so we're not as bad as plants yet in what we have done to the world. Uh, let's yeah. hope it doesn't always get that, uh, it also doesn't get that bad. Um, so, uh, but it's nice to have a, a relativistic perspective things every now and then well, if we bring this back to to uh, the the organization to teams right uh and if we look at you know from from that theory of even cognitive development self-determination or whatever you want to call it but essentially uh there is like you said there are many different thoughts frameworks around the, this concept but there are common patterns around this which is that our uh environment influences what we want what we consider important what we believe in right so growing up in sarajevo during the war where my dad was in you know three different concentration camps shaped me as a person differently than you know maybe my peers when i moved here as a 13 year old to the united states i had different beliefs 
grown up in that culture, going through that experience versus people um, or, or kids my age. So fast forward to where Milan is now a professional working, it's going to be different to motivate me as a person versus somebody else that grew up in New England or in California or whatever it is. So a lot of times there's one size fits all when it comes to motivating, leading people. And we don't take into consideration that context of their beliefs, their values. How do you go? Because that's like, you know, when we talk about systems and when we talk about, uh, you know, physical systems is one thing. When we talk about social systems, and, and how we interact, relationships, uh, and what's driving that, that's more of a softer side, human systems. Um, how do you see that human side, human systems, and how it ties to the living systems in the context of organizations and culture? Well, uh, it's um, um, one of the things that uh, that's still... Uh, I, um, uh, that's, that struck me when I read one of the complexity science books uh, that really was an eye opener to me was um, that um, uh, I don't know who, who it was who wrote it. It was like there, 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 there is no such thing as freedom, um, he said, because um, you only exist thanks to the environment which that has produced you and that sustains you. And that nurtures you until the environment decides that it's time for you to go. Mm -hmm. That is not freedom, right? <laughs> I depend. I depend on oxygen. I depend on parents having birthed me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I depend on so many things that my freedom is a figment of my imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was an eye opener to me because I've I've always that my freedom is so important to me, and that, that was for me like like obvious that it would also be important to everyone else around me, but apparently it's not, and yeah. it made me understand other cultures a little bit better where they have less emphasis on freedom and more on relatedness and and social cohesion, for example, I was not able to criticize that as much anymore <laughs> because of reading that complexity perspective is that well, hey, your sense of freedom yeah that's just your personal uh, illusion uh, be happy with it but actually there is no such thing because everything depends on everything else and in a way i thought it was beautiful um but uh, but also explained to me that my feeling of freedom yes that has also been fed to me by my environment just the concept of freedom is something that i received from the environment on which i depend uh so that's is ridiculous to think that i invented it or something right mm -hmm. um so all these memes as richard dawkins famously uh, came up with uh, many many years ago they uh, yeah they influence us and and your background is obviously very different from mine. I'm Dutch, so that also means that I behave in a way that is similar to other Dutch people. I might think I am autonomous, but I am almost copy pasteable across <laughs> across the country because there are many people like me here in this <laughs> in this part of the world who think in the same way and behave in a similar way. That makes me not really autonomous, uh, does it? <laughs> because uh, I am just the result of, of my environment and I need to accept that as a human as a human being and the same in, the same in organizations uh, the, the people the people form the organization but the organization also forms the people it is it goes in two directions that's called reflexivity mm -hmm. in, in complexity science uh, they, they depend on each other so the mindsets uh, of, of the people hopefully an agile mindset growth mindset, will inform the organization's culture, uh, but it's the same the other way around. The culture in an organization will shape the people working there. And uh, hopefully that is a, a positive, uh, uh, virtuous circle. But in some environments, it's a, it's a bad, a vicious circle that you get. Mm -hmm. And then maybe it's time to get out of there. We go back to where we started. Some people are happier when they just quit their jobs. And some systems you can only get rid of by letting them die because you cannot break that vicious circle. You just have to 
let it die. Move on. Yeah. Yeah. Move on. Get the parts out of that out of that environment. Put it. Put them somewhere else, uh, so that they can grow something new. Yeah, I was gonna say so something else can emerge. So maybe as a last question, which ties to all of this, is you know we put you know term agile. Uh, on you know dealing with complexity you've called it you know management 3.0 but really we're talking about same thing which is how do we deal with you know complexity that we're increasing complexity that we're learning <laughs> so uh what do you think is going to emerge from this uh i see a new paradigm emerging i don't know if you see that but something's going to emerge from this sooner or later uh that, that you know over the last 20 years uh do you think it's what is it do you think you know what would management 4.0 look like or what would the new paradigm look like if we look at the the environment currently and what we're dealing with well a number of things are happening first of all the obvious one is hybrid workplaces that is a pretty there's a quite practical thing that we need to solve in the next year or so that's going to change how we work. Um, but at another level, um, I have uh, I have noticed we, we made this really good switch or transition in many organizations from projects to products, which is good. Uh, you, you need to be responsible for the, the entire life cycle of a product and not just from one handover to the to the other. That's done. We have many organizations have accepted that. But I think we're not there yet. There's still a handover um, happening in organizations uh, between uh, those who make a product and those who provide all the other communication around it, which is finance, marketing, customer support, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it has happened quite often that I was either very happy with the product, but totally disappointed with the rest of the organization because customer service sucked or <laughs> marketing screwed me or finance was just a pain to, to handle or the other way around. It has happened that products were mediocre, uh, but workable, but the company was so enjoyable with such great people and, and finance was fast in their response and customer support was really good that I'm okay with the acceptable product because the whole package is positive. So I think we need to switch from product to experience because, uh, mm -hmm. and this is what they have already done in, in service design and design thinking with journey mapping, for example, understanding mm -hmm. what is the whole journey of a customer, of a client with all their touch points with our company. They sometimes call us, sometimes they chat with us on, on Facebook or WhatsApp, whatever. Sometimes they use our product, sometimes they come into the store and that's an entire experience. We need to respond, be responsible for the entire experience and the product is only one part of it. And I think such organizations as, as Apple and Tesla, et cetera, they understand this because I have some friends who ordered a Tesla and from the moment they order it, it is already an enjoyable experience, <laughs> just ordering it. They don't even have the product yet, mm -hmm. but already the relationship with the company, they found that enjoyable the way they were treated. And then I think that's a company that understands that it's not only about the car that is at some point being delivered. There's a whole mm -hmm. phase before and a whole phase after that you need to be feel responsible for. So we need to switch from product to experience and maybe rename the product backlog to the experience backlog. <laughs> and they need to be experience yeah. owners instead of product owners, et cetera. And that yeah. makes us more inclusive of the others in the organization, such as finance, marketing, support, who also impact the net promoter score and whatever you have of the, of the customers. So I think that's the next step. Oh,